következik James Womack, a Lean Enterprise Institute alapítója, számtalan idevágó szakkönyv, többek között a The Machine That Changed the World, a Lean Szemlélet, a Lean Solutions és a Gemba Sétnek című könyvek szerzője, illetve társ szerzője, aki a 80-as évek végén, ahogy önök is azt hiszem tudják, ott volt a fogalom megszületésénél az MIT. Fogadják nagyon sok szeretettel, James Womack. came over from Boston. I have uh, been living in Boston for the last four years, and it's only uh, six short time zones away, and so I'm in the middle of Iceland or something uh, right now, but I'll do the best I can. This is my life. I'm always traveling around. Uh, everybody has a copy, either in English or in Hungarian, of this book. Gimba Walks. Uh, Gimba, the place where people create value for some customer. Very simple. And I've always learned, and the only way I've ever learned is by walking around. And that sounds so simple. How could you say that your method is to walk around? Well, I can say that because it's true. The first gimbal walk that I took was in 1979. I was a student at MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. I was getting a PhD so I could be Dr. Womack. Uh, don't pay any attention to that. Uh, nothing I've ever done in life has anything to do with that. And my university suddenly became very interested in the car industry. And they became interested in the car industry because two of MIT's biggest partners who had sponsored a lot of research and who had endowed the School of Management, those two companies were General Motors and Ford. And suddenly General Motors and Ford in 1979 were in a great deal of trouble. There was a recession in the world, that was the Iranian crisis and oil prices spike. But uh, the issue was much deeper. That the Americans, and you know about this, uh, sort of think they run the world, you, you know this. And sometimes they sort of do, and most of the time they sort of don't, which is a good thing. But uh, they were used to, in industry, being number one, that uh, they were the best. And suddenly, these two massive companies, General Motors and Ford, uh, were in big trouble. And Chrysler had just gone bankrupt for the first time. Chrysler periodically goes bankrupt. And so that was not so concerning, because Chrysler was going bankrupt all the time, but General Motors and Ford. And so my university, MIT, said we should understand why these Japanese companies are doing well and General Motors and Ford aren't. And they looked around and there I was. And they said, uh, why don't you uh, take part in a big global project to understand this? Which to get started was financed by MIT and then other sponsors were found. And so I found myself in 1979 at the age of 31 with a PhD from MIT for the first time in my life going to see a factory. <laughs> Isn't that something? I'd never seen a factory. And by the way, my PhD was in political economy, a combination of politics, economics, public policy. So I'd never been in a factory. And I got a pass from General Motors, wish I had it here to show you, from the chairman's office that I could go anywhere in General Motors and see anything. And that's a pretty nice thing to have. So I went to Detroit, and I went to the Cadillac factory. And uh, Cadillac at that time was a very successful company still. It uh, has had hard times since, and perhaps it's coming back now. But I went to the Cadillac factory, where they made Cadillacs. I had never been in a factory. And I started at the back door, where they received the parts. Uh, by the way, by railroad cars, there was actually a railway line that came into the factory, big batches of parts that had come from factories all over. And then they welded the parts together and they painted them and they assembled the cars. And so I walked through, I spent a whole day, and they gave me a young engineer to go with me. By the way, that's always good to have a young engineer. I love young engineers. I've got a few this morning. 
and we took a walk together, and I could just ask questions. Now, many years later, Mr. Fujio Cho, the chairman of Toyota, who's just retiring this month, uh, gave me a way to capture that, go see, ask why, show respect. But I was trying to do that without having any training back in 1979. And I went through this factory, and what I discovered was there were 2,500 people building Cadillacs. 2,500, and it was a process, a value stream. They only had one assembly line, one value stream. It was pretty simple, a lot of variety in the product, but it was basically uh, the Cadillac company at that time just had one basic car. And when you got to the end of the factory, there were two doors. And one door said major repair, and the other door said minor repair. And so I said, let's go through there. And they said, oh, that's not part of our factory. That belongs to the sales organization. We're production. And by the way, we make 1,000 cars a day. That is our KPI. We must make 1,000 cars a day. And then we ship them over there, but that's not part of our factory. Uh, and so this is the end of your walk. Now, of course, I've known since I was a little kid, every child knows that what people tell you not to look at is what you should look at, right? <laughs> every child ever born knows this. So here they're telling me I should not go look at this, so off I went. And uh, that caused a lot of trouble. Um, it was actually quite an argument. But when I got to this, through those doors, I discovered there were 2,500 more people repairing the cars that the 2,500 people had just made. Now, I'd never been in a factory, but I looked at this, and by the way, I had no preparation. I said, this is wrong. These people are fixing mistakes here that were just made by people here. If you got it right the first time, you wouldn't need half the people. And I wasn't trying to get rid of people. I was trying to understand why General Motors was suddenly not doing very well. So, wow. That was my first gimbal walk. And I started at the beginning of a value stream, and I walked to the end. And I just asked questions. I went to see, I asked why. Why, 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 why would you have 2,500 people working to fix the mistakes made by 2,500 other people in the same company? How could this be? So then, having done that, it was time to go to Japan. And I had been to Japan when I was a student, uh, just uh, for totally different reasons back at the beginning of the 70s. And I knew Japan was a very weird place. And I say that uh, with affection, but a very strange place. And so I was prepared in my head for this notion that uh, if Japanese companies were succeeding, it must be something about their culture or something about something that was sort of like from Mars. But I still needed to go understand this. So I went to Japan with my co-author, Dan Jones, of uh, these many years. Dan and I have written a lot of books together. And we spent a couple of weeks in Japan uh, going to companies. And we went to Toyota and Nissan in particular. And we discovered two things. Uh, number one, that you could make cars with no repair area. Because all of the Toyota plants had one or two spaces at the end to work on cars not 2,500 people, but two or five people. So we could see right there that productivity was going to be twice as high. But what we also discovered was there was no such thing as Japan. That Toyota and Nissan were totally different. And I remember when we came out of Nissan at the end of our visit, a couple of days, uh, Dan and I looked at each other, this is about 1980, and we said, Toyota will conquer the world and Nissan will fail. We actually said that, and by the way, Nissan did fail. Nissan is now controlled by uh, the French, of all things, by Renault. They failed, they went bankrupt. And in Japan, we don't call it that, but that's what it was. And they were taken over by a foreign company with uh, Carlos Ghosn, uh, the new MacArthur, who came in to uh, straighten out their company. An amazing thing. So I knew right then, 1980, that actually Toyota had a different everything. And I also knew it had nothing to do with singing company slogans and doing calisthenics and all this weird kind of stuff. And by the way, there weren't any secret workers and there was no secret rework area. And the Toyota people, uh, they're not, that, not, as we would say in English, warm and fuzzy people, but they were very open. Every question I asked, they gave an answer that appeared to be uh, correct. So that was the beginning of my life as a gimbal walker. 
And in the 1980s, we needed to gather the information to document this story and show the difference in quality and productivity and flexibility between Toyota and GM or uh, Mercedes or Volkswagen. And so we spent a whole decade uh, doing that, putting it together in the book, A Machine That Changed the World. It was uh, in English, came out in 1990. I don't know, did it ever get to Hungarian? Did A Machine That Changed the World ever get to Hungarian? Never got to Hungarian. Okay. So that was the beginning of a long, long life of gimbal walking in the 80s, going through factory after factory, but also through product development. You can take a walk in product development through purchasing. What is the purchasing process? What is your value stream? Uh, you can take a gimbal walk in any human activity that creates value, because all value is the end result of a process or a value stream with many steps done by people. There's lots of technology, but there are always people, always will be. And you can go see Ask Why and Show Respect, and you can learn. So we did that in the 1980s. Uh, after 1990, uh, decided that we wanted to apply this to a wide range of industries. Uh, Dan Jones and I did our next book called Lean Thinking, 1996. Uh, by the way, that got to a Hungarian uh, in 2009. So it took 13 years. A machine that changed the world never got into Hungarian. <laughs> Lean thinking uh, took 13 years. And this only took two. This came out in 2011 uh, in the US, just when I stepped down as the head of the Lean Enterprise Institute. And here we are two years later uh, with, I hope, a good Hungarian translation. <laughs> Surely it is. And I hope you enjoy it. Uh, by the way, this is not meant to be a book that you read in one big whack. These are little essays. There are 50 little essays, three, four pages. And they're all based on an idea I had while taking a walk. What an amazing thing that I could make a living just by taking a walk. <laughs> and lots of different kinds of ideas. Uh, by the way, I took a walk yesterday. Uh, one of the rules I have in life is no walk, no talk. Okay. that whenever I go somewhere, and I go to a lot of countries, I was in China three weeks ago, in Australia four weeks ago, in Guatemala five weeks ago, uh, which is why I may be a little tired. And for any talk I give anywhere, I have to go take a walk. And yesterday, Avis Budget Zipcar, uh, the back office for Europe, uh, is here in Budapest. And so I spent the afternoon taking a walk through three or four back office value streams to see how people are doing their work and how they're trying to improve their work. So I know a little bit more about you uh, this morning. By the way, I saw some very good things yesterday, and I saw some things where everyone agreed that they needed to do some more PDCA, Plan, Do, Check, Act, in order to take out waste. I didn't say take out people, I said take out waste, and do more with less. Uh, the lean term, that's an old-fashioned English word that you know, meant skinny or whatever, lean, uh, was given a new meaning in 1987 in my office at MIT. Not by me, but by one of my young team members, a fellow named John Krafchik, uh, who is now the head of Hyundai <coughs> in North America. He's had a very successful business career since then. And we named it Lean because I said to my young team, of uh, young Americans who, by the way, all had worked in industry. They had come back to MIT to get advanced degrees, but they had all worked in companies, and they had worked in car companies, and they had worked in factories, and so they actually knew something. I said to my young team, we have discovered in our data, Toyota is up here, quality, productivity, uh, flexibility, and General Motors and Volkswagen are down here, and so there is a big, big difference. We know it is due to different ways of thinking and different management practices. And by the way, one of the criteria in our global survey on management practice was do your, co your company fix problems at the source? Or does your company ship them all the way out to the end and have a big rework area? And this made an enormous difference in productivity. All European companies had enormous rework areas. American companies had enormous rework areas. Toyota was the best in Japan. Practically no rework area. That was a management practice. This wasn't technology. This was just a management decision. Do we fix problems at the source? 
or do we run them out to the end? So we had the data. Enormous difference in productivity. Three to one difference between the European companies and, and the Japanese companies. Forget about cost per hour of labor. This is just hours of human effort. If you take three times as many hours to do the exact same thing, in global competition, you have a problem. So therefore, we said we need a name for this. What will we call it? And the term lean uh, was based simply on this. Uh, young John Krafchick said, lean management creates more value with less of everything, time, effort, inventory, capital expenditure. Let's call it lean. So I remember the whiteboard where we wrote lean. That whiteboard still exists in the team room. I just went to see it the other day. And that was 16 years ago. And we wrote down lean, and off we went. So then, uh, in 1996, we had done the lean thinking book. And I decided, how can I really promote these ideas? By the way, I still have an appointment at MIT. I'm a senior lecturer in the engineering systems division. And I have a seminar in the spring on the global automotive system, uh, which is, uh, attracts a lot of smart young people. Uh, in the uh, most recent class, uh, Henry Ford III walked into my class, and I said, who are you? And he said, I'm Henry Ford. And I said, okay, that's very funny. Who are you? <laughs> he said, I'm Henry Ford. And it turns out there's Henry I, Edsel, his son, Edsel I, Henry II, his son, Edsel II, his son, and Henry III. And the Ford Motor Company, five generations on, is still controlled by the Ford family. And young Henry, 30 years old, is the only Ford in his generation and management at Ford. That's a heavy burden. To think you're 30 years old, your name is Henry Ford. You can't be anything else but Henry Ford. <laughs> so I still have an MIT appointment. I still teach there. But I wanted a way to promote these ideas. I thought these ideas were so powerful that uh, it was just a good thing. And I wanted to run a nonprofit. And that's an important distinction that many of you are in the consulting business, and that's fine. That's fine for people to be. I view uh, consultants as being people who transfer knowledge. That's the job of consultants. And I like to transfer knowledge too, but I wanted to set up a nonprofit to make clear that I was not doing this to get rich, that I was doing this because it was the right thing, and I can pay myself a reasonable salary, but that's just me. I would have stayed at MIT, uh, except that uh, just I uh, felt I could do more out in the world. So I created the Lean Institute, and off we went. Now, that was the first Lean Institute in 96, uh, 97. Uh, the second was Brazil in 1998. And I had a colleague from the MIT car project, Jose Perro, who had gone home to Brazil. He was a business school professor in the big business school in Sao Paulo called me one day and said, I'm wasting my life here. Uh, I don't do any gimba. I don't have any chance to get out and see. I will set up a nonprofit just like uh, your nonprofit in Boston. So that was the first. There are now 18 and all over the world. And Hungary uh, is the most recent from a year and a half ago. So I have traveled all over. I've been to all of these. I've been to most of them many times uh, to try to share some knowledge and see if I can give people the courage to do some PDCA in their situation. Uh, in our work right now, in the US, um, we're not doing very much in manufacturing. That everybody should know by now what to do. Uh, by the way, General Motors eventually learned. Uh, when General Motors went bankrupt in 2009, it was a vastly better company than the company I saw in 1979. It was the best company it had ever been but they waited too late. And sometimes you've got to start early enough. I hope you will all start early enough. So 1998, Brazil. Uh, our star uh, company there is Embraer, uh, the airplane regional jet company. You've flown on their airplanes, I'm sure. When I first went to see them in 1998, they were just horrible. And I don't mean from a safety standpoint, but they were remanufacturing the plane. They had as many people in the rework area as they had in the production area. And uh, just there last year, and guess what? The rework area is gone. You can do this in airplanes. You can do it in anything. So institutes everywhere. And so here we are uh, in Hungary. Uh, just one more thing about the book, that after I had looked at General Motors and Toyota, I've always liked history. 
I thought I should go check out the history of where this started. And by the way, it started in this building uh, in 1914 with Henry Ford. That's me standing in the balcony of Highland Park. This, I believe, is the most important industrial building in the history of the world because this is where Henry Ford invented the assembly line and all the things that went with it and all came together by April of 1914, 100 years ago, next April. And he got a 1,000% gain in productivity. And that made the modern consumer economy possible. If a group of people can make 10 times as much as something, the manufacturer can reduce the price and suddenly everybody can have some. And that was Henry Ford's contribution to civilization. By the way, this building is empty. One of my projects is to get Ford to save it. Um, I go back and forth just with Henry the other day about why are you not saving this building, most important industrial structure in history. So I went through the Ford system. That was step one for lean because Henry Ford was the first systematic lean thinker. And then General Motors came after that because Henry Ford did not have a management system. Henry Ford's management system was very simple, ask Henry because he had designed the car, and he had designed the production line. He had one car and one type of production line. The car had no variety, zero options, no variety. And he could run the world's largest company and become the world's richest man without an organization chart. And he was very proud of saying that there was no organization chart at Ford. But, wait a minute, uh, Alfred Sloan at General Motors came along and said, Henry has it backwards. Everybody doesn't want the exact same thing Everybody wants something different. And so we need to build a company that can deal with variety. And what they couldn't do was both have high velocity, start to finish, product development and production, purchasing, and variety. And so GM's velocity was much slower. And it got slower, and it got slower. And then Toyota came along. And Toyota said, why can't we have high variety with high velocity at lower cost, not higher cost? And that's what a generation of Toyota in the 50s and 60s did. So there are really three parts of the story. It begins here, Island Park, with uh, Ford. Uh, General Motors invented a management system called modern management. And Toyota invented the next, and I think the world best at this point management system that we call lean management. And lean management is something we'll talk a little bit more about this afternoon because I want to talk with you about how you uh, can be gimbal walkers. We can all, everybody alive, can be a gimbal walker. Uh, this is good. People should do this. So I've now been talking about how I learned to be a gimbal walker and how I wrote it down. And you've got a book that's great for the airplane. And this afternoon, let's talk about how you would actually do this. So I'll be back at the end of the day and we can take it from there. Zero, what do you think? <laughs> now we got 10 minutes for questions? Okay, fine, that was good, that was good. I was told to take down to zero. You can't see the clock, right? <laughs> 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 oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Now I need these uh, devices here, wait a minute. And I'm told that if I don't do this right, see this is here, the microphone. I have to keep these away <laughs> from the microphone or you'll get screeching, okay? All right, I'm set. Kaptunk egy pár percet kérdésekre, és a terem végében már várakozik is két hölgy mikrofonokkal. Azt kérem szépen, hogy aki kérdést szeretne feltenni, az tegye fel a kezét, majd Gomek úr kiválasztja, hogy ki tegye fel a kérdést, amennyiben többen konkurálnának egyszerre egymással. És várjátok meg, vagy várják meg, legyenek szívesek, hogy odaérjen a mikrofon. A szinkron tolmács ugyanis csak akkor tudja fordítani, hogyha mikrofonba beszélünk, még akkor is, ha egyébként hallanánk itt együtt a teremben. És amíg elgondolkodnak a kérdéseken, és felkerülnek az első kezek, én megkérdezem először önöktől, hogy mindannak alapján, amit most hallottak, és annak alapján, amit most már tudjuk, hogy ennek milyen kockázatai lennének, ki az, aki örülne, hogyha Vomek úr végig sétálna a cégén, mondjuk holnap? Szép számmal vannak jelentkező. Ez nagyon-nagyon bizalmat is jelent az önök részéről. Ezek szerint biztosak benne, hogy semmi, semmi szomorú kivetni valót nem találna Vomek úr. És akkor gyorsan én is kérdezek egyet Vomek úrtól is. Volt-e már alkalma esetleg Budapesten végig sétálni? Oh, yes, yes. 
Yes, no, I went to um, the back office of Avis Budget Zipcar. Igen, de én most a városra gondoltam. And for Europe, they do the reconciliations. Oh, another city, I've done that before. I've been here before. <laughs> I was here with my family about six, seven years ago. We walked and walked and walked. That's a different kind of gimbal walk. Uh, by the way, lovely, this is a lovely city when it's not underwater. Okay? It's, it's just really a lot better if you keep the water down. And now um, that it's underwater, do you think we could have dealt with it any more efficiently? Did well, you do any know. gimbal walking? I don't know. It, I, I did not see that part. Okay? I don't know what you could have done more efficiently. Uh, I did walk right up to the water last night and looked at the water and said, hmm, this looked down right on the river in the middle of town. This looked a lot better when you could see it. Um, it, it really doesn't look like anything but water at this point. And water is kind of water. I, mean, I don't hate to tell you, but Japanese water, Russian water, American water, <laughs> Hungarian water, it's, it's water. And uh, maybe it was a unique color of brown. I'm not sure. <laughs> but basically it was water. Yeah. Uh, that's quite possible, actually. Tehát kérdések, pár percünk van csak rá most, de majd délután, a délutáni előadás után lesz egy fél óránk is arra, hogy ma megkortól kérdezzünk. Úgyhogy néhány jelentkezőt várnánk azért most is. Igen, itt ott van az úr az elején. Megkezdeném a kérdéseket. Mit vár a Bomek ura mai naptól? Közben nyugodtan jelentkezhet már a következő ember, hogy odaérjen a mikrofon. Well, conferences are about two things. Uh, they are about learning some ideas or methods, and they're about courage. Uh, the way these conferences run, and I hope you can uh, continue these, uh, is that people come to share some ideas, but people also come to tell their story. And we talk about lean transformation going from a modern management company to a lean management company, from a mass production company to a lean production company, from a old-fashioned product design company to a lean product design company. Uh, those transformations are hard. You all work in the world of what we call brownfields. A brownfield is an older organization that's been around for a lot of time with a lot of bad habits. Uh, with a lot of people who actually conclude they can't do better. And I see that in companies. There's no history in a lot of companies of actually doing better. We just try to do the same. So in these conferences, we try to share some ideas about how you would do better. We have speakers who do that. And we'd like to try to give people courage by asking those people who have really tried significant experiments, PDCA, to talk about uh, what they did, why they did it, what went wrong, what went right. And the idea is everyone can learn from everyone. So if we get to the end of this conference and you have gotten no new ideas and you have no more courage, then this is all muda, Japanese word for that which is waste. You can work very hard. Those 2,500 people in the General Motors plant were working very hard just to get rid of the waste that the other 2,500 had just created. So half of those people weren't creating any value. They were just doing Muda. So if you go home and you haven't learned anything and you don't have any courage, well, then this was all wasted. This was Muda. If you go home and you have learned something and you have the courage to try some experiments, well, then this was value. So it doesn't depend on me or the other speakers. It depends on you. And by the way, I'd be very happy to hear uh, of your success or your failure. People send me emails all the time. And if you do something really brilliant, I can put you in a book. I've already made that <laughs> offer to uh, Avis uh, Budget uh, Zipcar yesterday. So if they got here first. They might have worked all night last night. They might be ahead of you. But it's an offer that is uh, available to anyone. Uh, the Gimbal Walks book has many stories about companies who actually did something. You could be there. So is this value or is this waste? We will see. És ott még ott, ott van két kérdés, úgyhogy um, először a hölgynek talán a mikrofont. 
és akkor úgy sikerült meggyőzni a, ezek alatt az évek alatt a termékfejlesztőket, mérnököket, tervezőket, hogy menjenek le a valós életbe, és ne csak az üvegfalon keresztül intézzék a dolgokat. Well, uh, there's some good things to read about lean product development. Uh, my good friend Jim Morgan and Jeff Liker uh, have a book on the Toyota uh, development system. Uh, by the way, the reason the Ford company has done well in recent years is for one reason only, that they improved and leaned product development across the world. And Jim Morgan did that. Um, I, uh, long story, I've had a long relation with Alan Mulally, sometimes happy, sometimes not happy, he's the, the president of the company. And so therefore we've now got lots of examples of engineers uh, who learn how to think uh, through the glass and to make design products that can actually be made, which is kind of a, a novelty for some companies. Um, so there's a, there's a long history out there. Uh, we actually do know what to do and you can even read about it. Uh, engineering is a process. It's a value stream just like any other process. It starts with an idea and it ends up with a fully tooled, fully staffed production system that can now make the product. It's a complex process, it's long, but you can learn to see it. And by the way, you can dramatically improve it. So uh, for engineers here, um, you should do a little reading. Uh, there's a lot you can read. And then you need to try some experiments. És az úr is szeretett volna kérdezni? Igen, tudunk sétálni már mindannyian a cégen belül például. De mennyire hasznos, hogyha időnként külső szemlélőt fogadunk be, hiszen belső szemlélőként más kérdéseket teszünk fel, mintha egy külső szemlélő nézi végig ugyanazt a folyamatot. Mennyire érdemes a két módszert all companies, there, there are hardly any companies that this could be an exception, have to have suppliers and they have to have people between them and their end customers. If you're a car company, you have the dealers, you have the suppliers. Uh, if you want to have some outsiders to take a walk, why not invite your suppliers and your customers? Uh, they have some very strong feelings about how you run your process. And that value stream is shared with them. It's a shared activity. It's actually a team activity. But many companies, uh, it's an us against them. It's us against the bad suppliers, us against the bad distributors or sales organization. Uh, so some of the most interesting walks I've had uh, are to get together all the people, all the companies that touch a process, a value stream, and walk from one end to the other. Uh, by the way, I guarantee when you do that, the group of people who need to go together uh, will conclude that what they share is a terrible mess. They will say, my gosh, this is horrible. And they've never looked at it. It's amazing how many people have a career in a department in a company and have actually no knowledge of what happens upstream and downstream. How many people have a career in a company and have no knowledge of what happens upstream at the suppliers or downstream at the next step. They just don't ever go see. So lace up your shoes, take a walk, and look at the value stream. Uh, it always makes you better off. It never makes you worse off. Köszönjük szépen, az új két sorra a hátrébb is szeretett volna kérdezni, aztán van még egy kérdésünk ott a hátsó sorokban és a hölgy itt oldal, és aztán a többire majd délután, amikor lesz fél órán kérdésekre, akkor fogunk sort kerülni. Oké, okay. oké, okay. oké, okay. real quick, yeah. Beszélt a 80-as, 90-es évekről, 2000-es évekről. Üm, ugye ez, ami az, azokat az éveket jellemezte, ez a tapasztalata, ez akkor kompetitív edge volt, tehát versenyhelyzeti előnyt jelentett, ami mára már azt mondom, hogy itt sokan tanuljuk és sokan műveljük. Mi az, amit ma utazásai során lát, hogy 10-20 év múlva hasonló módon fog yeah. róla beszélni, hogy a 2013-as éveknek volt a versenyhelyzeti előnye? Milyen irányba fejlődik a lean ma right. legdinamikusabban? Yeah. Well, first off, I go to a lot of companies and say we've done lean. And I say, great, where? 
uh, let's take a walk. And yeah, they've got a program and they've got a staff that goes around and tries to improve things. Nothing stays improved. Uh, the line managers absolutely have nothing to do with this. Uh, and so it looks nice in the annual report, but it's actually a fraud. So there's a lot less lean out there than there should be, right? And in any industry for any company, um, if you are better at creating value with less, better value for the customer with less of everything, you're always going to be ahead. That never changes till the end of time. Uh, that will always be the case. So uh, the question is not is it 2013 or 2003 or 1993 or 1983. The question is how do you stand in relation to your competitors? What do your value streams in product development and production and purchasing and customer support look like compared to your competitors? That's the only question. Uh, I have not yet, including at Toyota, seen the truly lean company. Uh, the Toyota people for a while got very full of themselves and uh, thought they were really good and then they fell on their face, which was a great thing, a great thing to happen. It was a wonderful thing. Uh, failure is really good for you if your ego runs away with your brain. All right? So therefore, even Toyota, uh, lots of problems. Uh, the only difference between Toyota on a good day and many of your companies on a good day is that they're always aware of what their problems are. And many of your companies, if I may say, aren't even aware of what your problems are. So that's where we are. Uh, time to stop. Uh, could, I, could I just say one word of thanks to Audi and to Bosch? Uh, I've had a long association with both uh, the Bosch production system. We tried to help Peter Marks uh, develop it. And uh, John Shook and I spent a lot of time with Bosch. Uh, by the way, they threw me out of headquarters in 1982. They said we know everything. And then, uh, what do you know, they asked us back. Audi, uh, the good doctor, Dr. Piesch, when he was at Ingolstadt, called me to explain lean and said we can't do that. And then when he went to uh, Volkswagen as head of the management board the first time, 1970, 1994, called me to Wolfsburg and told me, I cannot do this, I will never do this, I will build products so brilliant that people will pay so much money that I don't care about cost, you may leave now. That's what Dr. Piesch actually said to me. And now we find uh, Volkswagen Audi uh, all across the world is doing all kinds of lean things. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> so eventually, uh, people do figure it out. Uh, the question for you is, will you figure it out sooner or later? Okay, I'll be back uh, this afternoon, enough for now. We'll all talk about how to walk. Okay, it's pretty simple, but you know, I do want to explain it so nobody gets hurt. And I'll see you then. Köszönjük nagyon szépen. A tessék, már is megbuktam volna az első vizsgám, mert én még akartam adni lehetőséget néhány kérdésre. De Vomek úrnak teljesen igaza van, most elfogyott az időnk, délután viszont lesz fél óránk, úgyhogy megkérek mindenkit arra, aki most jelentkezett, hogy tartsa magában addig a kérdést, aki nem jelentkezett, hogy gondolkozzon még délutánénk, hiszen ezért ez egy fontos lehetőség, ami majd akkor meg lesz.